Still working? Okay, perfect. <laughs> So, um, yeah, we started this new, um, more career-oriented event series, but we are still also doing the behind-the-scenes um, um, series. So please always follow our extrabootcamp.eventwide.com event announcements to always keep on track. Um, yeah, so let's quickly go over who we are at Exa Bootcamp. So as you all probably already know, we are an online academy focused on upskilling you to learn all the virtual reality, augmented reality skills you need to succeed in today's um, yeah, high-tech world. And we also have a very large XR developers community, which I'm also inviting you to join on Discord. Um, it's the XR Creators Discord. Maybe Dokan, you can um, yeah, share the invite in the channel. And um, what is really uh, meaningful for us is that we are really focused on your portfolio projects. So um, the experience we did with our advisory board, um, who are coming all from high level positions in the XR industry, all of them when hiring are looking at portfolio projects. And so um, that's basically what all our classes we are offering at XR Bootcamp are focused on. So um, yeah, and all our alumni so far, I mean, we are already giving courses for the last one and a half years. And we are very happy that um, all our students are very happy and everyone is, is really loving the content. So even if you're already a little bit more advanced Unity developer, you get a lot of content out of our courses, um, but also because we have a lot of good and great mentors, um, um, all, even if you're a beginner, you will be able to keep up and learn a lot to even get a job in the XR industry afterwards. So yeah, I mean, um, we had lots of lots of participants already coming from lots of different companies, great companies to work for, so that we can say that um, becoming an alumni of us, it's also an amazing networking opportunity, um, which may also result in future projects and common collaborative um, opportunities. And yeah, maybe uh, Ferhan, do you want to go over our, about our course portfolio, what we are currently offering? I hope. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me now. So, um, yeah, as uh, Rahal mentioned, we have uh, a different variety of programs uh, from beginner level to advanced programs. And uh, up to maybe the last two, three months, we were always known for advanced programs, but due to the interest of the um, VR AR uh, community, we also enabled our beginner programs, like we call it zero to hero. So you, without any, uh, we are development or uh, unity skill. We are enabling um, these upskilling programs, uh, which actually one of them just started, uh, I think, uh, five weeks ago. And uh, we um, we are having these programs for for uh, four months. And, and uh, the main goal is to help you um, have enough skills to start prototyping. And we are not. Uh, only focusing on the tools, but we are focusing on how to actually hack your way through the um, various challenges of VRAR world, which we will discuss in a few uh, minutes with Tyler and with your questions, of course. And we want you to be um, a good VRAR prototyper. It doesn't matter if you are a design background, you have a, a developer background, First of all, we believe that with our, all our industry partners and trainers, we believe that in order to survive in this industry, you need to have um, enough prototyping skills. And we are providing that even though you have um, limited um, knowledge about VR, AR development before. So the first program is two months of foundations bootcamp. And this program is helping you to um, uh, understand 
the coding and the tools, which is Unity in our case. And we have also another two months program, which is the prototyping bootcamp, and which also um, gives you enough experience in terms of um, creation of, of prototypes. So whatever you learned in the foundations bootcamp, you can actually um, implement it in these four uh, prototypes. And these prototypes are provided by our trainers um, as a different choice of selection that you can uh, select one of them. Uh, we are also open to different suggestions from our uh, students as well. But the key thing is uh, you are creating a meaningful portfolio uh, as a start, because without portfolio, um, we will also discuss in detail, it is not easy to show your um, superpowers, to show your experience. And uh, we want you to start these prototypes. But as you can imagine, for a person who just starts uh, learning VR AR, we know that you will have a lot of um, um, areas that you will get stuck. But we want you to actually create a safe and supervised environment so you can fail fast and a lot and learn a lot in the meantime and bring the experience that you will probably gain in a couple of years in this short uh, four months amount, uh, four months of time. And in the meantime, the career support is also uh, very important. How to create um, a portfolio, how to survive in a technical interview, and how to actually uh, create um, a job hunting strategy for your own um, career goals. This is something that we are also providing during this prototyping bootcamp. Uh, actually, uh, one of our, uh, the recruiters working on um, working with us, with you, uh, is here right now, Ryan. We will, he will also join us on the round table so you can actually ask some of the questions here. Um, so without further ado, I would like to actually give the stage to Tyler. Maybe you can share your screen. And um, Tyler, maybe you know uh, already from the event, right? Uh, uh, announcements, we are uh, so proud to see him. It is just the beginning of this unboxing XRB career uh, event series, series. And we always want to bring um, top leading companies, uh, VRAR team founders who have built teams from scratch and know all the potential uh, problems or um, like pitfalls that a candidate can, can fall into. And he will, he will give us some tips but please prepare your questions in the meantime and even uh, share your, your questions. I, you have two chances. One is you can directly use the Q&A button uh, on the top of the screen that you can submit your question. Or you can also use the career advice group, uh, channel in our XR um, creators Discord uh, server that we just shared uh, a few minutes ago. So Tyler, uh, stage is yours. Um, and uh, after Tyler's presentation, we will start uh, the Ask Me Anything roundtable. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for having me here. And uh, yeah, I'm excited. This is great. Uh, I first found out about the XR Bootcamp a couple months ago and uh, got really excited because they offer like a ton of uh, training from super high quality, uh, people from the industry and um, I was also very impressed that they stick with the people that they train until they get jobs and they offer uh, lots of opportunities for people to uh, be able to pay for the courses so like um, I, th I thought it was really cool that uh, one of the ways was um, you can take the courses and uh, work to pay it back uh, after you get a job within the career, within uh, the AR, VR uh, realm. And I thought that, that was like super cool. Like they're taking a massive risk, but it seems like they really believe in the stuff that they're making and the people that they're uh, bringing to the table. And like uh, they have such confidence in, in their teams that are coming out of these, the cohort, cohorts as they call them, that come out of these, uh, that they'll be able to get uh, a job in the XR um, 
community. So that's uh, just amazing. So thanks for putting this together, guys. This is this is really cool. Um, so starting off, my name is Tyler Lindell. Um, let's see, I. So big picture, I guess, is uh, I started the um, augmented and virtual reality group over at Tesla while I was working over there. Um, before that, though, uh, <laughs> I was just like a normal software engineer, like uh, a lot of people probably here, um, just you know, programming and and trying to figure out my way through my career and and get better as I go. Um, and that's, that's actually how Tesla ended up hiring me was uh, just as a software engineer. Uh, before that, I had experience uh, working with a project called um, R-Loop. And R-Loop is essentially a community of people from all over the world that met together on Reddit and came together, uh, built a Hyperloop pod, competed at SpaceX, um, and even won the Pod Innovation Award from SpaceX. And that was like really cool. Um, and the way that I got into that was actually through augmented and virtual reality. A friend of mine and I, we were like, you know, let's learn this technology. Let's try it out. And so um, he knew a lot more about it. And he's like, well, let's let's try using uh, Unity and let's try to put together something that just works on our mobile device. That way we can see like, you know, a view from the pass through camera and some things like uh, there and see who we can help for free just to get started. And so we called up a bunch of different uh, organizations and one of them happened to be the Hyperloop company, R-Loop. And uh, we were like, hey, we would love to build this for you guys. And they're like, yeah, that'd be so cool. And just like being on that project, I learned so much. Uh, and then uh, when I was interviewing at Tesla, they were also uh, impressed with the, the experience of being able to do that. And so hired me on as a uh, software engineer. And while I was there, I started realizing that Tesla is just kind of a place that uh, you kind of, you can create your own career. Like you, you get in there and, and that's great. And then what you do from there is you network and you meet people and uh, you forge like the, your own direction in which you want to go and help the company along. And um, so I was like, well, I don't see anybody really working on augmented or virtual reality in terms of like bigger picture. Like there are, there were teams at the time that were doing uh, projects that were very specific. But I was like, what if I could bring together people from all over the company and look at some of the biggest problems that Tesla Gigafactory and Tesla Solar are facing that are, it's like an overarching problem. And how do we figure out how to use uh, uh, what I'm gonna call spatial computing? Uh, it's the same thing as uh, XR, or AR, VR, but spatial computing kind of encompasses all of it. Uh, so how can I use this new technology to try to solve some of these big problems that this company is facing. And so within a couple of months, we had uh, a little over 90 people on our team and we were uh, talking with uh, people from sales and service and construction and manufacturing and uh, figuring out what these big problems were. Uh, and so that's kind of how I got into um, running and, and founding the AR VR group over at Tesla, um, just from a software engineer um, and wanting to solve big problems. And so what I'll do is I'll go through here and, and kind of talk about that, but also uh, for people who are getting into augmented and virtual reality as a career in general. Um, so first let's start with uh, uh, what level experience do you have? So when people are, you know, when we're out there and we're looking at uh, job requisites, uh, we, we see, you know, maybe like, you know, it requires two or three years of experience doing X, Y, and Z, or requires 10 years plus of doing whatever. Um, like I know that a lot of times it's placed under like requirements. Uh, but one of the things that I've learned, uh, through, uh, applying at a number of places and, um, being rejected a ton of times is those requirements are normally like really important to the company, but they're not like set in stone. Like you must have, you know, this many years of experience. So there's, you know, limits. It's kind of a, a stretchable uh, thing. So if, you know, they're asking for 10 years of experience and maybe you have zero years of experience or maybe two or three, it's probably not worth your time to apply to something like that. But um, if you have five to seven years of experience, it might be reasonable to apply for something that's asking for 10 years. Um, or if it's asking for two or three years, maybe they can handle, you know, somebody with a little bit less experience. Uh, or, or maybe uh, when they meet you, they think that you'd be such a great fit for their team that uh, they'll put you into 
maybe a different role that they have on their team where they can mentor and guide and, and train. Um, but just know that it's kind of like a flexible range, you know, probably within like uh, two to three year uh, range. So don't, don't feel scared applying for jobs that ask for more years of experience than what you have. When I, when I applied at Tesla, I, I applied uh, consistently uh, for weeks. Uh, and I think it eventually ended up being like three or four months of uh, applying to different jobs at Tesla uh, until I got a phone call from, from one team. Um, so yeah, don't give up when you're applying somewhere. Um, looking at augmented and virtual reality, the whole spatial um, computing team, the, like if somebody's gonna, if a company is gonna put together a team of people, it's not just engineers, it's not just designers. Like building technology in this realm requires a huge number of people uh, of different experiences and different um, skill sets. So what I have listed here is um, kind of a, a basic <laughs> list of people that if I were to build out uh, an augmented or virtual reality team, these are some of the, the roles that I would want to fill to make a, an incredible experience, an incredible application. Um, so developer, software engineer, um, uh, user experience designer, uh, somebody who understands uh, locomotion, uh, locomotion is just moving around in a virtual environment. A VOC specialist, so somebody who understands voice of customer is always like working together with the customer to understand what they need. Sometimes that can tie together with a user experience designer. Um, having a somebody who can do user interface design, somebody who can manage the project, a different person who can manage the product, uh, who's out there, you know, figuring out what kind of product is do we need to build? You know, what is uh, going to create the most value, value for, uh, for our customers and our end users. Uh, so even if you're not a developer or a designer and you want to get into augmented or virtual reality uh, or more broadly spatial computing, there's a number of opportunities uh, that you can come in as, uh, depending on what, whatever your background is or whichever your interest is. Um, so there's a few problems that I see with uh, the current um, spatial computing space. Um, and, and I'll go into more detail in a, min in a minute here, but a uh, two-dimensional frame of reference. Uh, so we're all used to using computers on a 2D screen, using our phones, which is also a 2D screen. Um, and so we all have this two-dimensional frame of reference and going into a three-dimensional frame of reference uh, is uh, incredibly different than uh, trying to design or build or even interact with something um, outside of what we're used to. Um, there's a lot of virtual reality enthusiasts, and I'll talk about that here in a minute too, but um, there's a lot more people who are enthusiasts rather than people who are creating or actually using the, the technology right now. Um, and then also our innovation adoption life cycle, the, the, the stage of technolo technology life cycle adoption that we're in, I'll walk, walk us through here. Okay, so for the two dimensional frame of reference uh, as designers, uh, people who are designing are used to maybe creating, you know, various boxes on a screen and boxes is a square um, or lining things up in like some sort of grid pattern or um, giving people the ability to sign in a certain way into an application. Uh, and then for developers uh, having to build um, around that and only having um, two directions to put things, uh, the X and the Y coordinates, um, and then building um, software that can support the interactions within just a 2D environment. And additionally for product, uh, when they're thinking about how we, you know, what problems people are facing and how do we figure out the solutions that are going to create enough value for people to use this stuff, um, isn't about, you know, people are having a problem with um, managing what they have to do in their day-to-day. -day. And so we need to create a to-do app. Uh, rather, they, they can think in like three dimensions. Like if you were to do maybe, for an example, like a 2D app in the virtual world, I mean, maybe there's stuff that, you know, people could walk around and do inside of this environment and, and it actually gets things done in the real world, perhaps, because of uh, APIs that are happening, happening on the back end or something. 
I'm just kind of spitballing and throwing something together, but uh, it's a big challenge going from a two dimensional thinking of designing and building these things into a three dimensional uh, frame of reference. Um, so on my website, tylerlindell.com, I've got it uh, listed here. Um, we have a form that shows up. It just pops up when somebody comes to the site and it says, are you an enthusiast? Are you a creator or are you a consumer? And they're broken down between augmented and virtual realities. And over the last three years, we've seen that the majority of people are not creators and they're also not consuming the content. They are simply virtual reality enthusiasts. Maybe they want to create or maybe they want to consume, um, but there's a lot of barriers where maybe somebody um, you know, likes the idea of using spatial computing to do something, uh, but they just haven't seen any applications out there that um, create enough value for them where they have to you know, put the money out to uh, buy a headset or buy a VR machine plus a headset. Um, so there's a lot of barriers. And so a lot of people are just enthusiasts um, but for the number of people who even like the idea of spatial computing, even fewer of those have even ever tried to use like a virtual reality headset or augmented reality headset. They just think it's kind of cool. Um, so I want to want to follow up on that. And so that's um, the most response that we get. Um, so for the innovation adoption life cycle, uh, for a long time, maybe like the last 15, 20 years or whatever, we've been like kind of down in here, like innovators, early innovators stage. Uh, but now we're getting into this place where we're starting to climb this, uh, this hill up here to early adopters. Um, and the early adopters are also innovators. So we're probably somewhere in here in this, in this range. Um, but the, the trouble with that is um, companies are taking a big risk in creating um, spatial computing software and applications because there's going to be such little adoption of the application that they may you know risk millions of dollars to put together an application and put together this huge team where they may or may not see the adoption they need to cover their costs it doesn't always happen but definitely a risk for companies and so Coming into this as a, a developer or a designer or a manager, project manager, um, interaction designer, all kinds of uh, roles that I showed earlier, uh, there's ways for you to create value for the team and the company that you're going to be joining. So one is going to be understanding, like understanding the problems. I'll go into these in more depth here too. Um, being able to go deep in uh, your understanding and your appreciation for the challenges, uh, being open and creative, as well as uh, your mindset is gonna play a big role in it. So first, let's look up, excuse me. First off, let's look at uh, understanding uh, what the current problems are. So this is one way that you can create value. So all the problems that I recently listed, you know, the risk to the companies who are getting into building applications for end users, um, understanding that um, there is, you know, a growing number of companies who need people and very few people out there who understand the technology enough to design around it or build around it. Um, like there's enough, there's plenty of designers and developers and people who could work on virtual reality, uh, but have done two dimensional problem solving so much that it could be very hard to transition into a three dimensional realm. And so there's fewer people uh, entering the 3D building and creation than there are uh, that are available for 2D. So there's like a bottleneck uh, of resources available for these companies based, based on the number of people coming into there to design and build. So being able to understand those problems and empathize with the company and the team that you're coming on to that they are facing those problems. Um, you can work to understand in depth the specific issue that your team and your company are considering building. Um, if you can understand uh, the problem that the end users are going to be um, trying to solve using this platform or software that you're going to be building, uh, work to understand um, how much work it's going to be to get there, uh, understanding uh, in depth the technology that you're going to be using to build this out, 
uh, understanding in depth the team dynamics uh, of the group that you're joining uh, are all super valuable uh, in helping your team move forward and, and uh, make massive progress. Um, one thing to consider when you're working on these things is uh, you're probably going to be doing stuff that's never been tried before. Uh, there are some things that have been tried before, like uh, creating a conference room that a bunch of people can be inside of or uh, building a dodgeball game or a paintball game. You know, those kinds of things have been done. And there's, there's a few others that, that are coming up. But in most cases, nothing that you'll be working on has actually been done before or, or maybe even not even done well. Um, and there's lots of room for improvement because we're at that early stage of adoption. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, so with all of these challenges, um, remembering that uh, when you come into a team, um, don't you don't need to come up with like tons of uh, just you know issues and, and problems with maybe a team structure, or, uh, the product structure, or the you know uh, the tech stack or whatever. But what you can do is come in with like a problem solving uh, mindset, and you can pick out you know, issues, things that you think that the team can grow in um, and figure out, you know, solutions around those problems and how your experience and, and your personality, you can use those to help uh, improve the team that you're joining. Um, remember that the product and software application, all that stuff that you're building is going to be iterative. Um, building any technology is iterative, but even more so in the spatial computing realm, um, because you might have, you know, five ideas on how something could be done. So you might build one maybe as a prototype and show it to your stakeholders and they'll take a look at it and say, well, we like this, but we don't like that. So then you'll go back and then draw, draw it out again, iterate, um, make some changes, bring it back to stakeholders. It's this uh, continuous cycle um, of iterations building on uh, one another to make a really, really great product. Um, for our team, what we do right now is well, actually, most teams that I've been on, uh, we, we have this collaborative mindset. So if, if whenever you're building something uh, that's challenging, um, it's important to uh, be there for the people on your team and also for the people on your team to be there for you. Um, so there's this thing called, that, that we call uh, rubber ducking. And I know it's a funny term, but it's the idea that if you were to have like something that you could talk to about the problem that you're working through. Maybe you're not able to solve it in like 30 minutes or a couple hours or whatever. And you can talk to a rubber duck, let's say, and you say, okay, you know, I've tried these things. Here's this, the problems that are coming out of it. Here's the issues that are coming from it. Um, and here's the things that I've tried fixing. And here's the things that I've tried uh, doing. So being able to talk through the problem and the solutions that you've tried uh, gives your mind the ability to think about the problem in a different way. And so that's what we'll do is we'll call up somebody on our team and, and we'll do something called rubber ducking. So I might explain the problem and the solutions that I've tried and all the steps that I've gone through. And sometimes uh, I can figure out what the problem is just because I'm talking through it. Um, and then if I'm not able to, they're able to ask questions that might trigger uh, some thoughts or um, problem solving things that uh, I hadn't considered before. And so that's like super helpful. So being collaborative with your team uh, will take you and your uh, product and your whole team very, very far. Um, so this is, this is one thing uh, like troubleshooting uh, that I've seen a lot of developers uh, have issues with. Um, they typically put in lots of console logs um, and, you know, sometimes it's not really clear, you know, where the console log should go. It's not really clear what you should be logging out. Uh, but if you're able to use breakpoints in your debugger and let the code stop at those breakpoints, you can use your mouse to hover over those things, like the variables, uh, and see what the values are in those variables, and then process uh, more closely to how the code is executing, um, what can be done or what is not coming through like maybe you expected. Uh, so being able to use a debugger and then for troubleshooting, understanding like uh, where does the data come in? Where does the data go out? And understanding the system well enough to say, okay, so I'm getting an error. I'm, maybe I'm not sure where it's coming from or 
Uh, maybe I do, but if I can put like a breakpoint or be able to stop the code somehow right here in the middle, um, you can do like a binary search type of thing on the problem where you, you stop the code here in the middle between where the data came in and the data went out. You can say, was there a problem before that? I don't know if you guys can see my hands or was there a problem after that? So if there's no problem up to your breakpoint, you know that it's after that. So you can take that uh, second part of the uh, tooling or the pipeline and cut it in half and say, um, did the problem happen here or here? So you're breaking down the problem in halves until you find the solution, which is much quicker than saying, was it here? Was it here? Was it here? Was it here? Um, it, it makes you uh, super quick at uh, being able to troubleshoot problems. And then uh, I have on here creating technical designs. And uh, when, when, when we're building out features inside of a uh, software, sometimes it's easier if we just go in there and we start you know, fiddling around because maybe we don't know exactly how we want it to work. Um, but sometimes if we can stop for a second before we build anything and go to like draw.io or uh, Lucidchart and put together you know, a couple of boxes, uh, kind of like this, and draw together, you know, here's the process that I wanted to go through. Here's some conditionals that it might have to process. You can think through how your feature is going to work, how the code's going to work, the logic, all that. Um, and then it even gives you the ability to move things around. Maybe you didn't like the original design and it even gives you the ability to have talking points with other people in your team. You might be able to go to product and say, this is how I think this feature should work. And I then explain how the data flows through it. And maybe they're like, oh, that's not really the end result that we were looking for. But it gives you a talking point and the ability to think about things in a way before you build it. Uh, so it gives you the learning of how a, uh, a feature is going to work. It gives you uh, the knowledge of you know, thinking more clearly about how your whole software might work. Um, and also gives you the ability to talk to people about what you're planning on building. So there's lots of learning that can go in there. Um, so when we're going into an interview, uh, there's a number of technical questions. And so I wanted to go over those uh, real quick. Uh, my, my method of interviewing people is probably uh, different from other people, uh, but I'll walk you through this here in a second. Um, now that I say that, I don't know. I've been through a lot of interviews where they're all different. Some people uh, went out on Google and said, what question should I ask a developer who's working on this kind of project? Uh, and those questions are like really boring. Um, but the ones that are, that are interesting are like, you know, how do you think through this real life example of something? And so that's kind of the approach that I like to take. So at the beginning, I'll ask people, uh, well, I'll say to people, there's a number of questions we're going to go through, just like any other interview. Um, there's some that you, there's uh, all of them you can choose to not answer, but there's only one question that you cannot, you cannot skip. And then I'll ask that question initially. And it's uh, about what they like to do outside of work, because I'm going to, I'm going to be spending potentially years with this individual. Um, and so I want to make sure that, you know, there's a good fit personality wise and like we can talk about things other than programming um, and, and relate on things other than programming. Um, I like to work with people I enjoy working with and, and I think that's probably similar for a lot of people. Um, and then the, the next question. Well, as we start getting into the questions, I'll say, uh, make sure that like when we're going through these um, you can, you can say your answer, but uh, if you want to go back and say, you know, where you feel uncertain about some of your answers or different points about your answer that maybe you're uncertain about, uh, that's highly encouraged because if, if while I'm interviewing somebody and they can specifically point to things in their logic on how something works, it gives them the ability and me the confidence that they have the ability to go onto Google or Stack Overflow and research the answer specific to where they're uncertain about something. Um, like developers, like we spend a ton of time Googling and Stack Overflowing, uh, all kinds of stuff that uh, we've never uh, worked on before or maybe we don't work on like every single day. And so it's useful to be able to understand uh, where we're unclear on things. Um, another thing I'll ask is uh, somebody to create, to like, not to actually like create a custom file type, but I'll say if you were to have this uh, 3D 
engine and uh, you needed to create a custom file type to capture the data about a cube in a space, what types of data and how would you structure that in a file, um, like a custom file type. So then when we put it back into the engine, it could re-render that, uh, that cube. Um, and I've heard lots of like super great answers. Uh, the thing that I'm looking for here is um, that people understand or try to understand like the uh, properties that make up a cube and the things that uh, might be important to hold on to uh, between um, saving the file and then loading the file back in. So it's more of like a data structure type of question, but uh, it's fun to think about. Um, I'll give somebody an example of a problem that's happening. And I'll, I'll say, what are the first steps that you might take in trying to troubleshoot this? Um, one issue, one issue that sometimes I'll ask is like, if you have a cores error, uh, and maybe you're building, you know, a web-based, um, VR experience and you get a cores error, what is some of the first steps that you would do to find out what's causing that error? Um, and sometimes people will know what a cores error is. Sometimes they'll not know what a cores error is. It's cross origin resource sharing. It's a, a security feature in browsers. So then if you are using your client on localhost and you're trying to access uh, example.com, um, if example.com doesn't specifically allow uh, cross origin resource sharing, then the browser will throw an error uh, saying, you know, we're not going to allow you to grab stuff from this API over here. Uh, so I asked people, you know, how would you look at that and how would you try to solve it? Um, and then we do have like a short coding um, session where uh, we want people to be able to code against uh, nested lists. Uh, so like an array of an array. Uh, we want to see how people think through the code. We want to see how people ask questions while they're coding. We want to see people like see how people um, collaborate when they're programming. Uh, if we give suggestions, how do they process suggestions or, or questions that we have? Um, some of the coolest things that I've seen is like, uh, we might ask a question and the person that we're interviewing uh, in the coding interview will make a comment inside the code with like the question so then they can think about it um, a little bit more, which is it's, it's pretty unique. Uh, it's nice when we see developers uh, be able to stop for a minute, um, think about something, process it, you know, maybe they're not sure initially, and that's okay. Um, we just want to see how people work together with us in a situation like that. I mean, it can be stressful for sure, but it's more about being able to ask questions and work together uh, than actually being able to completely solve the problem. Excuse me one second. So prototypes and uh, Git repositories. Uh, do I look for them? Are they he helpful? Are they not? Um, I don't. I don't ever necessarily ask for prototypes. Um, I don't ask for Git repositories, but when they are available, I like looking at them um, because if if one person has the same skill set as another, um, how does one stand out against the opposite? Um, and sometimes that can be really clean Git repository um, where they, they're doing clean coding, like maybe uh, Uncle Bob might suggest, not, obviously not 100% like Uncle Bob is suggesting. Uncle Bob is a, a guy on YouTube that and he's also got a book uh, called Clean Coding. You can search him. Um, but I, I like a lot of his uh, stuff. And then uh, for prototypes, if somebody has prototypes, uh, maybe available on the web or something or for download, I do like looking at those and that can definitely separate uh, one candidate from the other. Um, it could be for the better, or it could be for the worse. Um, it just kind of depends on, on how well stuff's done. Um, so it can be helpful for sure. Uh, I don't ask for them, uh, but it's super, super nice to see. Uh, I think it's cool to see that people have stuff that they're proud of. Um, so one of the things that I've done over my career is 
uh, tried to ensure that um, I create a personal brand and something that, something that I learned in college um, where I can be good at something um, and I can be known for something, um, which helps me stand out in, in the um, resume filtering process as well as the interview process. Um, and some things that I would encourage you guys to do is if you're uh, wanting to learn something, um, it can be really helpful if you create a podcast or a YouTube or write a book or start a blog about something. Um, even if you're still like in the learning stage, like you don't have to be an expert to do any of those things. Um, you're going to learn so much more about the stuff you're working on if you are trying to teach other people what you're learning because you'll have to think deeper and learn deeper about the content that you're working through uh, in a way that you can explain it to other people. With that being said, uh, figure out ways to help people. Uh, make sure that you stay focused on what you're working on uh, and take risks, like the risk that I took when I was at Tesla, um, asking, you know, <laughs> how do I start this AR VR group over here? Um, figure out how to take, take risks. Like I was so nervous. I was like, geez, this isn't me. Like I've never done this before. You know, I'm just a, <laughs> just a developer here at this big company. Uh, who's going to listen to me, but um, taking risks definitely pays off uh, when you take the right ones. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, my name is Tyler Lindell. Uh, you can find me at LinkedIn, uh, linkedin.com slash in slash Tyler Lindell. Uh, I founded uh, Tesla's AR VR group. Um, here's some additional resources. Um, if you're looking for a job in augmented or virtual reality, um, right now we have this update here. I'll, I'll talk about it in a second. But if you go to tylerlindell.com slash jobs uh, tomorrow, that will work. You can go and find jobs over there. Because I, I recently updated the DNS settings today because we were working on this for a while. But today, if you wanted to go there, it's update.tylerlindell.com slash jobs. Um, if you want to uh, add a job to that job board, uh, it's just tylerlindell.com slash post a job. And there's an update on the beginning of that, just like www. Um, and then I've also got a podcast that I produced um, right after my time at Tesla, um, which talks about how to start an augmented and virtual reality group and the, the steps that I went through um, and how I uh, was able to do it and some of the things that I learned. Uh, so feel free to check that out. This one here is available on tylerlindell.com slash podcast. Um, and so that is what I have. And uh, we can open it up for questions and the round table and all that good stuff. Thanks for having me. Perfect. Thank you, Tyler. I mean, uh, every uh, slide is opening another door. Uh, even for me, uh, I, I really learned a lot. And it is uh, very concrete. So. I hope that it is helpful for everyone. Uh, thanks for spending time on uh, having a recap of your own perspective and your own experience. And um, maybe um, we can also invite other uh, experts in our group to actually uh, start joining us. In the meantime, I will also uh, invite uh, some of our um, um, alumni, students, and um, trainers. So uh, to to this roundtable, maybe they can also ask questions. We have answered a few uh, questions with Ryan. So thanks, Ryan, for for uh, taking the initiative. Uh, but uh, we will we will have at least like 20, 30 more minutes to to answer more questions. There is actually interesting. Um, um, questions coming back some people are actually wanting to share their portfolio i don't know if we have time to look at that but um you probably see the questions if if you can look at the portfolio of um, ashish dubey maybe uh, we can also give some positive or negative uh, comments because he accepted uh, to to uh, be exposed uh, for the sake of learning more, which is a courageous move, but uh, it's actually a very nice uh, opportunity for, for people uh, um, who wants to get into this industry. So I think I, um, I'm looking at one more time. I think I uh, invited everyone that I know of. 
Um, so if I forget anyone, please let me know. So um, how we should proceed? I mean, I can ask one question before before starting the other questions. Um, regarding your own path, when you, I mean, maybe there are some people here who are just starting to get into the VR AI industry with the right skill set, but there are maybe some people who already been in the industry freelancing or already getting a junior role. What is the path towards and um, becoming a VR AI lead on a on a, a small or big company? It doesn't matter. But what is required? Like maybe you can a little bit mention a little bit about um, soft skills um, that is needed. Is it so much different than any other software lead role, or are you seeing, uh, especially due to the multidisciplinary um, uh, team uh, characteristic, maybe? And, and different requirement needed for becoming a lead. Yeah, um, it's going to vary quite a bit with uh, which company you're at. Uh, the size of the company um, will matter. Um, the context in which you are becoming a lead matters. Uh, like for me, like uh, I was the way that I presented it to Tesla and uh, to the legal team at Tesla was. I'm starting an AR VR group. Um, so this is for people to join while they are, uh, you know, working in their free time. And uh, one of the Tesla legal team was like, well, yeah, like this is like super important because I've seen companies that don't get the jump on new technology early enough. And instead of spending hundreds of thousands of dollars building something like this out, they end up spending millions and millions of dollars building something like this out because they didn't jump on early enough <clears throat> and uh so becoming a team lead in the context of maybe you want to start an enthusiast group at your company like that um can be like a softer introduction into leading a team and then as you're going along uh learning as much as you can uh teaching people on the team uh, as you can and being able to keep track of people um, and the stuff that they're working on is important. Um, so the soft skills needed is like communication, um, being able to think about, um, software and, a, and a product in a broader sense. Um, having the ability to like, uh, either answer people's technical questions when they have them or knowing that you have the people on your team uh, that have the skills to be able to answer those questions appropriately and then redirecting uh, to that person. Yeah, so know, knowing your people, communication, all very big. Perfect. <clears throat> I mean, um, in our, uh, like the second month of our prototyping bootcamp, we have a phase that we call it MVP phase that you are actually joining forces together uh, instead of prototyping alone. And we want to actually bring the uh, different disciplines or perspectives in one team. Um, managing a team is uh, maybe a different discipline team is uh, maybe sometimes challenging or even being in that same team. So are you seeing these communication uh, issues between especially different um, disciplines like designer, prototyper to developer, or um, what is your, what is your um, like approach there to make everyone in the same common uh, like um, planning or brainstorming or briefing, um, let's say resonance. I yeah, so if you've got all these different people from their various skill sets and backgrounds, how do you communicate across uh, <laughs> like those different uh, skill sets and, and vocabularies? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and even um, conflicts, maybe there are some conflicts, right? Because it's not only communication. I think conflicts may, if it's managed nicely, I think it's not a uh, so bad thing at the end, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I, I learned like a lot um, about communication 
uh, when I was over at Nike. So I was, I was at Nike last year uh, working as a software engineer. And one of the things that I learned the most about was communication because um, they had like all types of leadership training and stuff. And uh, being able to, as a lead, work through communication uh, of different people on the team, you want to allow others on the team to work through the problems on their own if they can um, and only become a mediator uh, when it cannot be resolved outside of uh, them working together or them figuring out how to work through it together. Um, being able to communicate like with other people, if maybe you and they have a misunderstanding or a disagreement about something, um, it's important to remember that when we communicate, we don't say you or I, more of like, you know, this happened, like just talking like the facts of what happened. Um, and saying like, it seems like this happened. It seems like, uh, or it looks like this happened. Um, and it did this. Um, so trying to remove like the emotional and the you versus me kind of context and more of like collaborative, like, hey, it looks like something happened over here and it caused this that other thing to happen. Um, figuring out like, you know, how can we work together to fix this as a team, uh, as opposed to, hey, hey guy, hey girl, uh, you really messed this up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe from an um, HR and recruitment perspective, um, Ryan, is there anything that you would like to add? I feel it's uh, very much just uh, understanding and giving feedback in the right way to people, just as Tyler said there. And just really listening to how people kind of came to the conclusion, but also educating them in the right way. Um, Tyler pretty much hit the nail on the head. <laughs> so I didn't really have much to add there. So. Perfect, perfect. So uh, let's continue um, with the questions. There is one question of um, what does the process of talking to other sectors, construction, healthcare, training, when you are trying to find the problems to tackle. Okay, so uh, sectors means here, I think different uh, yeah, industries, right? And, um, and you are trying to find the problems to tackle. Um, are we talking from a um, solution or provider or freelance perspective? Um, if it is the case, maybe uh, from like a freelance perspective that might be something that any of our experts can answer. Do you have any answer to that, Tyler? Or have you understood the question? Um, the way that I understand this is like, uh, when I was at Tesla and I talked, you know, had had a number of conversations with people from um, service and sales and construction, um, people in the training department, these all these different departments within Tesla, um, the process of, of talking to them uh, was, was more like, uh, you know, I want to find a way that I can help, but I don't really know what the problems are that uh, I can help fix or work through. Um, so coming together with them and being collaborative and uh, allowing them to spitball and, and giving yourself the opportunity to uh, come up with like ideas and uh, no, like understanding that no idea is a dumb idea. Uh, just listing out all the ideas, regardless of, of how big or small they are, um, coming up with like just as many ideas as possible, super helpful. And, and that will work uh, regardless of the industry that you're talking to. Um, there, there was one question here. Uh, how do you compare between uh, someone who has great ideas and someone with great software skills. Uh, some of that comes from experience um, as a software developer. Um, when I look at somebody's code, um, the way that maybe they structure their code, um, I've structured my code in similar ways, or I've seen other people in uh, PRs structure their code in similar ways. And uh, I just, know like 
some ways that it could maybe be cleaned up a little bit. Um, we're, we're not doing anything that's like, like needs crazy optimization, um, but you can kind of look at some problems and understand like there's a massive complexity issue in somebody's code um, where maybe they've got like a ton of nested conditionals. So like if this, and then it's got if else, and then under that it's got if else, uh, like it's just to like, it just makes so much complex code. It's like hard to read, uh, hard to maintain. Um, and somebody with great ideas, but not the ability to program, um, won't, I guess just, they won't be able to answer a lot of those technical questions that I asked. Um, sorry to go off track there, uh, track there um, but I wanted to answer that question before uh, we got down too far. Yeah, um, uh, one, one more, um, actually, um, before going to the next question, one announcement for the next uh, event of these Unboxing XR Dev Careers. Um, we are uh, really excited to announce that also we are, maybe for those who are on the medical sector already knows them, they have just been invested uh, for $27 million uh, for their uh, surgery simulation uh, product. Uh, they are, I think, over 100 people already. So um, their team uh, and CTO will be uh, in the next event with us. And uh, you can also maybe ask these questions or have to talk with the other sector because um, the vision of the company is actually how I can bring the existing skill set on a game industry and then convert it to for enterprise or healthcare, which is quite interesting for, for us as well because there are many talent uh, and uh, skills that you can find in game industry, but um, how you would utilize it for a specific use case is maybe um, something uh, that needs to be discussed. Did you have um, game developers or directly like even recruits or headhunt from directly game um, game studios and then you um, you recruited for Tesla or Nike? Um, so the people that were joining our team at Tesla uh, were all internal. Um, and so it was, uh, I, I held uh, meetings on a regular cadence and uh, invited people from all over the place at Tesla to come to those meetings. Um, and actually that's, that's where most companies find uh, people for their teams. Um, so it's probably... I don't know what percent, but it's probably in like the, at least 60% or 70% of the roles get filled internally. Um, and then outside of that, um, a, a lot of the roles are filled by um, people that hiring managers know already, uh, maybe outside of the company. And then beyond that is where jobs start hitting uh, job boards and uh, start um, going and uh, like third-party recruiters start uh, looking for contractors to fill roles. Um, so it's probably like 10% of jobs that actually get to that level. Um, I don't know if that's the exact number, but uh, it's probably uh, fairly close. Um, and so for our, for our teams, uh, they were all uh, internal. Um, except for my current role. So I, I currently work at a company called Fluke and we're doing a uh, um, thermal imaging, um, like we're helping uh, thermographers to uh, work through their images that they take um, and be able to edit them and stuff. <clears throat> but um, it, for, for this team, we've been looking at mainly uh, external uh, resources. And uh, we, we work with uh, third-party recruiters uh, in most cases. And I know that there's a lot of big organizations that uh, like working with third-party recruiters because they can bring in somebody as a contractor uh, and work with them for a period of time. And then they know like, you know, this is somebody that we definitely want to keep around for a long time, for years, and then they can hire them, hire them, hire them on full time. Uh, but on the other end, if the, you know, contract's over, 
um, and maybe they can't find a role for the individual or something like that. Uh, it's no harm, no foul. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, recruiting specifically from game company game companies, uh, we are we're not looking specifically at that. Um, although I do know that uh, companies like um, Facebook and other big name VR companies uh, do like to have people who have experience. Um, but um, what I like to look at is people who um, fit a certain skill set and uh, don't necessarily need to have like augmented or virtual reality experience. Um, there's, there's just, I mean, there's such a low number of people out there with that kind of experience. So it, it can be a lot more valuable to me finding somebody who has really great software skills um, and also fits really well with the team and then be able to teach them other things we need. Yeah, uh, there is actually one question uh, related to that. Maybe uh, as a next question also, EJ, if you would like to ask your question directly here, please prepare as well. In the meantime, I will read the question because it's a long one. So uh, it says, uh, I, I don't know the name, sorry, uh, I couldn't see here. Uh, I'm a product manager and have been driving various clients transformation to XR, operationalized a startup for launch, etc. It seems that teams are typically looking for professionals that wound up in XR through the standard software engineering path, but I didn't. I had many uh, interviews where teams struggle with where to place both the fact that uh, both this fact uh, and my level, I'm a mid to senior level professional at this point. What do you recommend as I continue seeking opportunities in this space? Um, besides driving delivery, I've done design thinking workshops, introducing the technology, content, instructional design, deployed realware, HoloLens, WebXR for some clients. Uh, so yeah, this is the question. Do you have any suggestion from that perspective, like from a product manager, um, Pat? Um, I was trying to find the, uh, the question so I could read through it too, but um, so it sounds like, uh, you said that came from EJ? Or uh, a name that no, you... no, this is an, another question, EJ. Uh, we can, we can uh, take that. But this okay. is a question that comes on chat to one of our team members. So okay. um, for everyone, if you would like to submit questions, please submit on the Q&A because it's very difficult for us to find on chat. Um, so please submit your questions on the Q&A uh, tab. So it sounds like this person is a project manager. And yeah, they are, again. they're trying to get into the spatial computing space or they already are and they want to become an engineer. Uh, yeah, I think uh, he or she wants to have much more creator uh, role, uh, but uh, because of the software engineering skill path uh, expectation, uh, I think uh, this um, person has some uh, struggle because they cannot place uh, the the, the techni technical recruiters cannot place uh, this skill set mm. nicely. I think. Okay. Um, so it sounds like uh, this person is a project manager. They want to be a project manager on an AR VR team, or I, I guess I'm having a hard time following it. Yeah, I, I also have difficulty on understanding, but as far as I understand, uh, he or she wants to become much more on the uh, part of the production or development rather than... Okay. Um, rather than uh, like becoming a project manager, product manager. Yeah, that's fair. How to maybe transition from becoming a product manager or like a manager role to a to, um, much more creator role, let's say. Yep, that makes sense. So a lot of times transitions like that are easier in-house. So like if you're already working on a team as a project manager, it can be easier to uh, say, you know, I want to start doing software development or uh, designing of some sort or whatever role that you want to take on, talk to like the manager of the team that you're working together with, because it's a personal relationship. Um, and maybe they have, you know, um, the 
enough, maybe they've got enough uh, senior engineers and mid-level engineers where they're ready to take on somebody that they can train. Um, and, and actually that's one other thing that uh, I didn't mention. So like <clears throat> in interviews, um, for a long time, I was always like, oh man, I don't have like the skills that they're going to be looking for here. I don't, you know, I'm not good enough for like this, this team, but like, uh, what I've realized now, like on the other side is, um, we, when we're hiring people, um, there, there are times where our team's need is for a very experienced person. And then there's other times where we're interviewing people who we're like, you know, we're ready to take on uh, somebody who has like, uh, like intro level or in, maybe beginner intermediate level and we're ready to train them. Uh, and so we're looking for somebody who's really excited about our project, about the product that we're building, really excited about learning and like open to, uh, to feedback. Um, so it just depends on what the team is looking for. So if you're able to either find that the team that you work together with as a project manager uh, has, you know, availability for somebody to enter a role like that, uh, just just ask them, like talk to them and, and let them know what your thoughts are and like what you want to do and maybe some stuff that you've done outside of work to try to learn it. Um, and if it's not the team that you're directly working with, choose, choose like another team uh, within the same company uh, that you might be friends with or don't know yet. Um, outside of that, uh, it could potentially be challenging to find an entry level with a recruiter, uh, but definitely not impossible. It's just uh, that like coming into a role like that with no projects or prototypes can be super difficult. Uh, and that was what I did like right off the bat when I was starting to get into software engineering. So I've got a business degree and then I taught myself how to program um, because I just needed to, I needed to build a website and I couldn't have been like, nobody was willing to build it on my college budget at the time. So I just learned how to program. Um, but having my own projects and showing, you know, I've done projects, I've done this work and like, I can build stuff that's rel related to like what you guys are working on, uh, can be a huge leg up. Perfect. Perfect. So, um, one question, but, uh, I would like to ask to Ryan if possible, um, what is your advice to a student? about to finish a bachelor degree in media technology and seeking to say, specialize in the XR industry as a developer. So um, maybe uh, Ryan, or if you uh, you don't have any, okay. do you have any, uh, any similar path, career path that you saw? Um, I, w I would say that the best thing I can tell anyone who's coming out of university doing a degree is to keep making stuff outside of your university projects yeah. look at what companies out there the kind of projects they're hiring for and have a play around and make your own projects because everyone who's finishing a bachelor degree would have made the same projects you've made in university so make more projects and have a really strong portfolio to back it up and if there's a certain company you want to work for um have a look at what they're doing and make stuff as tyler just said that's similar to that um that matches up with their expectations and you can say hey i've made something similar to what you're working on i really want to work here and it shows them in that sense um so yeah the portfolio and just keep doing that little bit extra outside of the university projects to really step ahead yep yeah um thank thank you ryan uh, ryan is from by the way from meta uh headhunting they are doing an amazing job in terms of finding the uh, impossible talents even uh, in the most senior roles to beginner roles. So um, I think maybe Ryan, you can share your link if uh, there are an, any maybe person here who wants to recruit or who wants to actually be um, recruited or job hunting, maybe they can reach to you if you can write the link, perfect. Mm -hmm. Ryan wrote so you can reach the team meta team they are really knowing who to reach so um, that's great so um, EJ uh, had one question I don't know if EJ if you are available right now if not I will read your question yeah or... I'm available for him ah, perfect perfect so would you like to ask in person yeah 
Uh, hi, Tyler. Uh, first of all, thanks for that great presentation. Um, it was uh, particularly helpful for me, I think, uh, especially because I also am uh, a software engineer currently, and you know, I'm looking to transition into the spatial computing uh, side of things. Um, so I just had a couple questions. Uh, I guess first of all, you know, what are some challenges that you faced, you know, transitioning and working in spatial computing as opposed to, you know, a traditional software engineering role? And I guess related to that would be, you know, what is your favorite part of working in spatial computing? Yeah. Um, so the software that I'm building right now is actually uh, all web-based. Uh, it's not even spatial, just spatial computing. Um, the work that I'm doing mostly in spatial computing um, has to do with uh, my website, tylerlindell.com, where uh, we are putting together uh, resources to help people who are in the augmented and virtual uh, reality realm. Uh, but when I was transitioning uh, from just doing software engineering into doing spatial computing, because I, I built a, a number of projects that were in that realm, um, it was just a lot of practice uh, using Unity and using Unreal. Uh, I, I really like Unreal because of the, um, the high fidelity and like just the great quality of um, visuals that you can get inside there uh, very easily and quickly. Um, <clears throat> but I did start with the Unity and I was like, well, how, how does this work? And like uh, it, Unity uses C Sharp as a programming language and I had C Sharp experience going into that, so that was helpful. Um, and I just did like, uh, some of it was tutorials, like I might find on Udemy, uh, cause there wasn't a whole lot around for people doing uh, AR VR at the time. And I was like, okay, so I just started putting pieces together. I was like, so here's an idea is like, you know, if some, if some mechanic wanted to use virtual reality to like learn how to work on a car, like how would they do it? And so we, we had brought in a model of a NASCAR, like a 3D model that we found for free. And then we're like, well, how do we make it raise up into the air, you know, if you're close to it? And it started off just using like your, your uh, arrow up, down, left, right, so you can navigate. And then uh, we started just adding one thing after another and building up the skill set um, and kind of using uh, didactive reasoning. So like uh, taking like the big picture of what I want and then uh, boiling it down to like smaller pieces to where like the smaller pieces might be much easier um, to, to accomplish and then building up uh, from that. So like learning, this is actually one thing that I tell people that I work together with is like um, to be incredibly exceptional at something in very small amount of time, um, learn the alphabet, like learn the alphabet of what you're working on. Like if you can learn like the ABCs, the very basic building blocks of anything that you're working on and, and learn them over and over and over just repetitively, uh, you can make up any word you want because you know how the letters um, look, you know how they sound, you know how they interact with each other. And so just learning like the very basics over and over, uh, you can extrapolate any complex uh, thing that you need to after that. Yeah, that's uh, that's great. Thanks for that um, great answer. I guess uh, relating to that last point you made would be, you know, uh, with whether you have any resources for learning spatial computing development. Like, what would be the ABCs of spatial computing in your point of view? Yeah, um, I would say XR Bootcamp. Uh, I know that you know we're in this meeting and like. <laughs> Uh, I'm not just saying that because like I should, but I really think that they have uh, ex like they have experts from the field teaching this stuff. Uh, they have experts who are working at you know some of the most well-known companies and what, uh, well-respected companies um, teaching these things, um, so they can help answer questions and help build up like those very foundational things. Um, outside of that, like. What I've used to build up my skill sets over the years is uh, Stack Overflow, uh, YouTube videos, um, like 
some sometimes you know like let's say you go to XR bootcamp and, and then you come out of it and later you're working on something and you're like oh man i don't know how to do this so um what i do in those cases like when i don't know how to do something is i, I get resourceful i find out like who's answering these uh, maybe i'll buy a, a quick video off of like udemy or something like that um or like I, I pay for Pluralsight and also something called a cloud guru because uh, we do a lot of work in the, in the uh, cloud. And so just having resources available to uh, pull out uh, different pieces of inf information from uh, is helpful. Thank you, uh, Tyler. I mean, EJ actually uh, is uh, one of our graduates from the most advanced class we have. So cool. I think, uh, yeah, he's, He's, he has done an amazing uh, project uh, at the end of eight weeks. Uh, I'm still actually showing this to the new students as a, uh, how can it, um, something like that can be done in uh, eight weeks while you are following the advanced uh, class assignments. So um, I think there's a huge uh, opportunity with EJ. So we can teach people, we can help you gain experience in a short period of time but it's all depending on the commitment, right? Commitment and your vision, how to uh, approach to the VRL industry. So if you are committed, we are always happy to support you guys anytime um, during these events or uh, in the master classes, boot camps. So thank you, EJ, for, for um, asking these interesting questions. Yeah, uh, thanks, Rohan. Thanks, Tyler. Yeah, I also wanted to say I definitely recommend XR Bootcamp yeah thank you thank you ej uh, by the way um, for those who are really curious about anything that we are discussing we will continue the discussion on uh, discord so you can always um, ask questions and find some of the alumni or students or experts here so uh, we have to unfortunately close in less than five minutes but uh, i would like to take maybe one or two last question so um yeah, uh, have you get the chance to look at uh, Ashish's um, portfolio? I know that it's not easy to look at the videos, etc. But uh, maybe um, afterwards, yeah. uh, if you have the chance, uh, we can always give um, yeah, hang on uh, one second. feedback feedback to him and um, experience and tools. Can you see it? Yeah, 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 yeah. We can see. I think if you go to the portfolio section, I also look a little bit. There's a portfolio section. The, um, where is it? It is, I think, on the top. I think I found it. Yeah. Cool. While you are looking, I will ask something to Ryan um, as a wrap up, actually. Um, yeah. Ryan, if if there is a, a magic trick that a talent who is uh, joining an interview or job hunting has um, like a superpower to make empathy of the technical interview and a technical interviewer or the, the lead software programmer of that company, what would be the, the best thing to, to understand while on, during the interview um, the, the interviewer better so you can actually respond and answer the interviewer's questions better. Is there any trick or is there any question that will help us to understand the, um, uh, the recruiter's perspective? Is yeah. there any hint on that? There's I one question that I yeah. really believe people should ask more often which is the person who's interviewing them, ask them why they join the company they're at what made them interested in working at that company? Um, because if you can find out they've got a similar path to you or there's something to relate there, you've instantly got a topic of conversation to break the ice between the two of you. And the thing with an interview is a lot of people treat interviews where it's a one-sided conversation. It's actually as much as you finding out about the company as it is them finding out about you. Um, and they need to also sell themselves to you as you are selling them yourself to them and that's mm -hmm. so important so i tend to ask i tend to tell people to ask why did the person they're interviewing join join the team um 
and also find out what interests them about that project or the team because that's where you can find that common ground very interesting yeah. if people don't ask questions in an interview then i probably won't pick them up because oh, they, yeah. they don't they don't seem interested in working with me or with us yeah it's such a way of seeming engaged and even if you have no questions and the interviewers answered every single question that you could think of just try and come up with something because it shows that you're invested in them um and it really shows that you have a keen interest in them as a company and you want to find out more yeah actually one one question that i ask i'll just tangent off of that real quick one question that i ask when i'm being interviewed uh that um typically like the person is like oh man nobody's ever asked me a question um and and so they feel good i think <laughs> um is uh for whoever fills this role what types of things are you looking for that would uh not only show that the person is fulfilling the need you have for this role but maybe even excelling well that's yeah that's, that's a good one yeah that's really a good one i would really Oh, by the way, we will prepare some kind of like a um, article of the key takeaways of these sessions. So this one will definitely be there. So thank you, Tyler. I think it's a very interesting because then you can see the vision of the company and this role, and you can even see a path towards um, promoting yourself after getting that role, right? So. That's very interesting. You are immediately asking the KPI or beyond KPI of uh, that role. That's very interesting. Okay, we have to wrap up. I have one last question. For those who shared resume and uh, portfolio, we will do these events um, uh, regularly. So don't worry, please join us. We will definitely look at that. Um, maybe Ashish um, uh, portfolio or resume, if you checked, uh, Tyler, do yeah. you have a very quick comment about since we are having one at least use case in our hands? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's see. Recent, well, probably within like the last 12 months, uh, I uh, paid for a course on uh, how do I, you know, improve my resume? How do I improve my interview skills? Um, and like, I would, I would recommend that to anybody. Um, but uh, one thing that he mentioned quite a bit in the course is uh, when you're doing like a resume or a portfolio, uh, make sure that the information the person is looking for uh, is at the very top. That, that is like um, where most people will look. So on, on our website, uh, tylerlandell.com, we track how deep people scroll on the page and uh, anybody who comes to a page, 100% scroll at least 5% down. And then as you go further and further down, the percentages of people that go further and further down get lower and lower. And yeah. so if, if your most important information is in the top 5% of the page, um, that, uh, that is where you're gonna get the most, the most value for your resume. Um, and then the next uh, maybe you know, 25%, um, a little bit less, um, most important, but still like uh, details that describe what's happening in your first 5%. Um, and then it gets deeper as you go down. Um, so if they, you know, like what they're reading here, they might want to find out more details, which they can find out more details here. Um, and, and as they scroll down, and I noticed that it's like a lot of it is over here, which is really good. Um, um, so based on the information that's, uh, here in the resume, um, it's one thing to be able to say, you know, I designed and developed for two, excuse me, designed and developed for two interactive installations. Cool. Um, you can say that, but like, are there any like pictures of it or, uh, any details maybe on like a, an additional page that like show what that looks like? Like. Uh, it was made for Wildlife Trust of India. Um, it would be cool, maybe maybe on their on their website they've got a link to it or something. Like you want proof somewhere on your resume of the things that you've done. Yeah, 
Perfect. I mean, we can we can definitely continue these kind of explorations in the upcoming events. Um, one one last question. Uh, it's actually um, coming from one of the illustrator background um, um, students in our current XR bootcamp. She's actually one of the uh, most well performing students as well. Emma. Uh, she's asking, and um, I was wondering what your experience is working with creatives or seeing people transition into more tech heavy roles. Um, do you have any suggestion from an illustrator or from a creative uh, background transition to much more development background, which from our perspective, it's actually a prototyping skills, but do you have any, any tips using the creative mindset as an advantage and build development skills afterwards? For sure. Um, one one way to transition, uh, like uh, Ferhan said, was uh, being able to build out prototypes. Uh, but maybe you are already building out prototypes uh, through maybe something like Xure or something like that. Uh, but if you're not, maybe you could start there. Um, and then either alongside of that or after that, or maybe even before that, I mean, it depends on what you want. Like you might be able to do, uh, like have more focus on front end programming uh, where you're using a lot of HTML, CSS, JavaScript kind of stuff. Um, and as time goes on, more and more of the logic for uh, applications is moving to the front end. And so you can easily transition from somebody who's um, building out like the, the structure of the website using HTML and CSS uh, so you have the structure of the HTML and then the styling of CSS um, works, works well for somebody who would be designing. Um, mm -hmm. And then they can, as they're going along, they'll be in the code where all the logic is of JavaScript and stuff. They can start learning how that works, doing some of the JavaScript uh, development on their own outside of work maybe to hone those skills. Um, and then maybe like during a, a sprint planning or something say, you know, I'd like to pick up uh, one of those uh, JavaScript um, stories. And then there you are. You're, you're then doing some logical programming and stuff. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tyler, for your uh, great answers and presentation. Unfortunately, we have to uh, close now um, because we have already uh, exceeded the, the time. But it was a great presentation and uh, roundtable discussion. Thank you, Ryan, as well. Thank you, uh, our experts and alumni, students, and everyone here who has uh, asked questions and listened. I hope that was a, a great um, advice that you get something as a key takeaway here today. If you like this event, please share with us on Discord, on uh, uh, social media so and even share with us if you would like to see someone in this uh, stage so the the um, uh, most important part that we want to achieve here is to bring the team needs who can talk actually technically uh, what is needed as a skill what is needed in terms of interviews so um we would love to continue these discussions with the uh, great speakers like Tyler in the upcoming sessions. So thank you, everyone, and uh, hope to see you in the next event. And for now, uh, I would like to say good luck with your career and upskilling. Thanks, guys. Appreciate Bye. Bye-bye.